All right, so we are back in Building 26 in Windows World. Today we're talking about the user mode driver framework. Who are you? Introduce yourself. I'm Peter Wieland. Um, boy, you know, I never had to introduce myself. <laughs> well, what do you do? Are you an architect, a developer, a I, tester, what? Um, I'm a dev, dev lead right now. Um, I've been a developer most of my career here. I've been here about 10 years, 11 years now, I think. Um, wow. Which is amazing how much, how quickly. Have you always been in done. Windows? Uh, yeah, actually I have. I worked on storage drivers for about seven years. Wow. Um, I'm one of the few Microsoft employees who's only had like two managers in my entire career. Nice. Um, which is really kind of nice. I like the stability. Sure. Um, I know a lot of people who get reorged all the time. Uh huh. Well, cool. is that because you, you know, so not a lot of reorgs happen in driver world? No, actually they don't. Um, <laughs> I when I came on the store, the I was actually part of the Windows NT driver team, which was a five-person team, um, and it's gotten big now. It's split up. Um, but yeah, I mean, at least initially there weren't any real grabs for for driver stuff. It was just sort of supporting supporting role. It's only been in the last few years that we've really realized what devices mean to Windows, I think. Interesting. So, so why why drivers? What 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 attracted you to writing drivers? Um, well, I mean, initially it was I wanted to do OS work. Um, I came out, came out of college and loved operating system stuff. Cool. Um, and there were only a handful of companies who were doing real production OS stuff, and Windows NT was the most interesting of the lot to me. Mm. Um, Drivers I like because it's an inf drivers I like because I like doing infrastructure work, um, plumbing sort of stuff, mm -hmm. and drivers are sort of contained. There's a lot of customers. Um, there's there's particularly now with the way the developers the developers are coming into it aren't necessarily as strong as they used to be, mm -hmm. um, just because it's becoming so commoditized, and so there's a real need to re take this complicated, really complicated concept and reach out to these less skilled developers and be able to bring them into it and get them to build good quality OS components. So it was a good challenge there. Absolutely. I mean, and that, that's a great segue into the user mode driver framework. Now, we talked to Doran of the kernel mode driver mm -hmm. framework. We had it, and he showed us the pictures of this rather complex system. I'm assuming it's mirrored for you? Very much, very similar. Um, so what is it? What do we got going on here? Okay. So, User mode driver framework really is an idea is to take all of the ideas that we had in KMDF um, that we actually had in, in WDF um, and make them available in user mode so that you don't have to write kernel extensions to the system just to make your device work. I mean, if you look now, there are a lot of devices, cell phones, um, dancing USB Homer dolls, I mean, it's all sorts of things out on store shelves. And you look at it and you think, why in the world do I need a kernel extension to make Homer dance? Yeah, it's the silliest thing ever. Um, but the architecture that Windows had was that all hardware runs through the kernel. Um, all hardware runs through trusted components. It's all part of the trusted computing base. Mm -hmm. um, we're not really trying to get away from that. Right? I mean, UMDF drivers still look like, UMDF devices still look like devices to apps, and that's really key. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to make sure that you can implement that up in user mode where, you know, if you crash, it's still a terrible user experience, right? The user's lost something they're doing with the device, their app isn't going to work. It's still confusing, but it's not a blue screen and they're not losing all of their data. Exactly. Um, so at least it can be better. Absolutely. So what were some of the challenges? I mean, how do you make a user mode driver framework? So clearly the operating system has to allow for certain devices to actually run in user mode. There's plumbing that has to go on there uh, below your framework, obviously. Mm -hmm. right? Yep. Um, there, so one of the cha the biggest challenge, I think, initially was just framing it, right? Picking what are we going to support. Um, and there's we, we made some decisions early on. We only support what we call top-level drivers right now, which are drivers that are accessed only by user mode. So kernel, kernel components can't talk to user mode drivers because there's a bit of a, a level problem. Right? Okay. You have kernel up calls are always dangerous. You, you rarely want to call up into user mode on a thread and then allow it to potentially call back down and grab a different lock. And 
deadlock the thread. Um, and so we sort of put off looking at that. Okay. Um, but there's still, you know, I mean, most of the classes of devices that we're talking about, that's just fine. So what are so the, what are some of the devices that, that run in user mode? So, okay, so in in Vista, um, the Windows Portable Devices team, WPD is their their acronym. Mm -hmm. um, they are probably our biggest customer. So they're building an infrastructure for media players, uh, cell phones, any of these little devices that you try to synchronize um, is really what they're reaching out to. Okay. So anything that uses the multimedia transfer protocol uses UMDF. There's a, a driver in the system that loads the WPD model on top of file system devices, so USB keys, mm -hmm. with the idea being that you can stick a USB key in and then sync music to it. Mm -hmm. And all of that goes through our infrastructure. Um, Windows Sideshow devices, which are these auxiliary displays that they're trying to put on laptops, yes. they use UMDF. Um, they're a really good partner with us. Okay, great. Um, Active Sync. Active Sync is actually moving their drivers out of user mode into out of kernel mode into user mode. Um, and if you've ever dealt with the Active Sync stuff before, yeah. it's a good thing that it's yes. like, no offense, but you know it, it had its issues, and I'm happy that's <laughs> out. Um, we're working with a bunch of teams to prototype additional stuff. Um, the Smart Card team. We did a demo at WinHack of a user mode Smart Card. Nice. And smart card's really an uninteresting demo. I've right? got a card, I plug it in, I pull it out, yay. Mm -hmm. But um, for us, it's really cool because they, they're a team where we we went in, and I, I know the storage people, so I went in and talked to them one day and said, what if we tried this? Mm -hmm. um, we've solved some problems for them because they can use WDF and fix up all their PNP bugs. Mm -hmm. um, and these drivers are really easy to implement because you just you can use the Win32 API, you can use your your window, regular Windows debuggers. You don't have to worry about kernel mode code and interrupts and everything else. Excellent. So it really simplifies it for them. Absolutely. And so are, do you see that uh, there's going to actually be a lot more um, driver developers coming out there? I mean, like with .NET abstracting away the complexities of Win32 yeah. to some degree, now you're abstracting away the complexities of writing drivers. Um, is it because more devices are coming along and you expect more? It's because more devices are coming along and also because devices are just becoming so cheap. Um, right? When when the margins for devices get really low, when the cost of building the devices get really low, then the cost of your development starts to look bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. um, so you see, I mean, there are well-established consultants out in the industry who say they're having trouble finding jobs because everybody's hiring college kids. Um, to do their driver work. We used to joke that it was the guy who wrote the firmware then wrote the driver. Now it's it's the college kid comes in and he gets stuck writing the driver. Um, mm. And if you talk to the developers in the community, a lot of these junior devs um, feel like they're getting dropped onto projects without any training. Um, right? I, they came out from college, the hardware team they're working with said, oh, a driver, that should be easy, we'll let the new guy write it. So they don't have any real kernel training, they don't have any really device knowledge, mm. and they're sort of dropped in and forced to do this. Okay. Um, and so if we can reach out to them, that's a big thing. There's a double-edged sword in, in lowering the bar, right, which is more people can develop drivers, but now you don't, since the barrier to entry is lower, mm -hmm. the drivers may not be as good. And so we're really, we're mindful of that. We want to try and push everywhere the driver quality should be very, very high. And this is about reducing risk and not letting you be sloppy when you write, when you write driver code. Absolutely. I mean, that comes in, you know, your, your pre-fast for driver stuff plays into that. I mean, in other yep. words, tools. So you're providing some tools yep. that will help developers. Unfortunately, pre-fast for drivers and STV don't actually work with UMDF just yet. Uh -huh. That's something we're looking to address. <laughs> um, PFD, we haven't had the time. We haven't really had the time to look at it. Some of the stuff in pre-fast for drivers doesn't apply, right? We don't have an Urkel. So mm. Urkel checks are meaningless for us. But I think memory allocation and locks and stuff like that will apply. We just haven't really had a time to look at it. Um, and then SDV has the limitation that it only works with straight C. And UMDF is a C++ based it is. system. But well, it doesn't have to be. But Cool. I mean, that, that was something to discuss in the sense that since you're in user mode, you're already abstracting away what has to happen in the kernel. Cause 
in the end, a device has to go through the kernel at some point. Yep. And so I could write, uh, add another level of abstraction, I could write a, a C-sharp driver. Uh, I want to write VB drivers. Or VB drivers. Not, not because I like VB, but yeah. because I should be able to. Okay. Um, yeah, I got into this, actually it's funny, I got into this team, the WDF team, um, when I was done doing storage work and had a little period of sort of languishing. Um, one of the things that I got really interested in was trying to do managed drivers. And actually the idea of doing managed code in the kernel. Excellent. You know, and I didn't get very far with it. And I was one guy, I was looking at Rotor, um, and Rotor is really bound to user mode, um, and not that well documented at the time and everything else. But when we came over to this team, that was sort of one of the things we've been incubating, incubating on the back end is what can we do with managed. Um, my theory, you know, the, the way I usually put it is we want driver developers to concentrate on writing, on driving their hardware. And so whatever tools they want to use to do that, we should try to enable them. If, if they're comfortable with VB, they're probably going to write a better VB driver than they are if we force them to write something in straight C or C++. So Absolutely. we're really doing a disservice if we can't do this. Now that said, getting managed code in is has a lot of, um, it's going to require work. And so we're, we're not, still not sure where it's going to sit in our priorities with with all the other work we have to do. Absolutely. But I mean, could a, I mean, could I write a proxy class? I mean, I, I, yeah, um, actually one of our, one of our test drivers, actually I think it's one of our internal samples, mm -hmm. um, is written in C Sharp. Um, one of our test guys went and wrote a, we use COM for our interface. Cool. And so COM interop. Yeah, so for a while we had, we, we were sort of really using COM in the, in the, the middle files. Mm. Um, we were sticking to the COM rules about where optional parameters go and stuff like that. And we actually had TLBs generated and then we were using TLBM to generate an interop library. Um, we decided there was some stuff, like the annotations we were trying to do, I think didn't work with that. Mm. And so we had to pull that out. Um, but we think we should be able to put it back in. Very cool. Point. So let's let's talk about it like from a programmer perspective. Okay. What is what does it look like to me? I mean, as a driver developer, you see seeing all this big chunk of code, much of which maybe you don't understand or could care less about because you don't need it because your device doesn't care about power or some other system function, and so you just cut and paste a bunch of code and then you write your your algorithm for your specific device and then it looks like it works and then it blue screens everything. Yeah. So. What does it look to me like now, up in user mode as a um, developer? Well, so a lot of it, it looks, in a lot of ways, it looks like WDF. Okay. Um, so we tried to follow, we didn't follow the WDF API, or the KMDF API, because we mm -hmm. moved to C++, we decided to use COM, mm -hmm. um, but we tried to follow the programming model wherever we could, um, so that if you know how to do something with a queue in kernel mode, you know how to do something with a queue in user mode might be slightly different function calls, probably the callbacks are phrased differently, but the same basic coding patterns can apply. So WDF has a lot of advantages for us, and, and probably the biggest one is that it just abstracts away a lot of what was in WDM, the old driver model. So you don't really have to worry about PNP at all. You really don't have to worry about how to hook up dispatch routines and how to get herbs and what herbs look like. You, you see a bunch of discrete, opaque objects for your driver, for your device, mm -hmm. for IOQs, which do flow control, and then for requests. And then you hang callbacks off of those things in order to get your driver into the IO path. So if you want to handle a read operation, you, you have your device, you've set up a queue through which everything flows, and you set up a read callback on the queue. And then when a read comes in, your callback gets invoked, we give you a request, you can get the buffers out of that, you can decide if you're going to send something down to the lower device, process it yourself, fail it with an error, and it's pretty straightforward. And WDF tries to take, tries to provide a lot of support around ref with reference counting internally so that you don't have to worry so much about what the lifetime of all these objects are. You don't have to worry really when to delete your device because WDF knows 
when your device is finally done, when, it, when we're finished with it, and can destroy it then. Mm -hmm. And as part of destroying it, it, it invokes callbacks on all of these child objects so that you can, you know, if you have three queues, you can clean up the state of all your queues before the device gets destroyed and stuff like that. Cool. So it, it I mean, it's still a complicated model. Mm -hmm. um, it's a complicated problem. And, you know, we're trying to focus, our, our first pass on it may have focused a little bit more on, well, did focus more on people who already knew how to do drivers. Or at least knew the concepts behind them, than on people who are completely foreign to the idea. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of room. There's still a lot of room where we can do do better lower level APIs. You know, I'm wondering if I sometimes wonder if like Monad could be an interesting programming model. The the new shell stuff, PowerShell, mm -hmm. could be an interesting programming language for doing drivers. If what you're really trying to do is sort of move blocks of data around or something like that, something really simple and and straightforward and procedural. That would be nice. Um, but it gets tricky when you're trying to interact with devices and you have events coming up from the device and you have little bits that you have to flip here and there. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot different than it's a lot different than like copying files and, and parsing. There's not so much of that in the driver, and it's a lot more uh, manipulation of data structures. Absolutely. Very cool. Thanks. So, uh, why do you think it's important to have managed code? Uh, you know, obviously because you get the framework. But what what excited you about getting managed code down to the kernel? Because we've talked about that before in Channel Nine. I mean, I remember mm -hmm. we interviewed Chris Broom a long time ago, the CLR, one of the CLR architects, and we're like, you know, what do you think about a managed kernel someday? And then he's like, well, and not in the foreseeable future, obviously, but. Yeah. So you, uh, so you worked on a, like a like a CLR light, I would imagine, kind of construct. Yeah, I looked at some. Of, I, I looked at some of the issues. I, like I said, I never really got anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest classes of, of driver errors is memory management. <laughs> Going over the end of a buffer, double freeing something. I mean, even let's let's ignore overruns, right? Just leaking memory or double freeing memory or using stale pointers. Mm -hmm. right? These are things that are. I used to have this sort of puritanical view of it that, that if you can't get that right, you don't belong in the kernel. Um, and sometimes I still feel that way, but the fact of the matter is we know a lot of people who are working in the kernel who, who have trouble with these things. I have trouble with them right now. I still touch invalid pointers probably pretty frequently. Um, <laughs> you know, I usually assume that That's that the problem with pointers. if there's a problem that can be had, I will hit it. Uh -huh. um, and so, you know, just moving to managed code, if we could just get garbage collection, right, and we could get it, drivers are a reasonably contained problem, we sort of know the lifetimes of things, we could try to be smart about when to do the collections, um, and we're not talking about some massive GUI app here that's got megabytes and megabytes of memory in use, we're probably talking a couple hundred K at any one time, mm -hmm. most of it persistently allocated, and then some slopping around quickly as we do per request stuff. Um, if we could get rid of the memory allocations. That would be that would be amazing. I think that would really help our help our C A numbers. Um, and I I like C sharp. I really do. It's a cool language. And this is coming from a C plus plus guy. This is coming from a C guy. C guy. Um, UMDF is probably the first C. UMDF is the first productized C plus plus project I've been on at Microsoft. Hmm. I was working on Fiber Channel for a little while in the storage team, and I use C++ there to do some stuff. But it's only been in the last, I mean, C++ gives you a lot of things, and our team, our WDF team in general, has been trying to use it where it's useful and then ignore all of the fluff. Mm -hmm. um, but there's still a lot of C programmers around here. So. And are you, are, they, are you finding that they also like C Sharp, the C guys? Quite a few of them do. Huh. It's, it's funny. I mean. NT is a very NT, even though it's written in C, is still fairly object oriented. Mm -hmm. We have we have this object manager thing, which which handles anything you can get a handle to. Mm -hmm. uh, we have pretty much every one of our data structures. We have APIs named well so that you can find them. It's not perfect, mm -hmm. but but it sort of tries to bind functions to data. And so you know those sorts of C plus plus concepts are pretty or C sharp concepts are pretty easy for everybody to. To grasp. Excellent. Very cool. So, um, 
clearly can't do a demo of UD uh, enough. Unfortunately not. Um, that would be, because I mean, it would just be writing some code. And So what's your environment for writing code? Uh, what do you mean? What, what would I use as a developer, ah, okay. as a newbie? Well, I have to right, write a driver. I don't know what yeah. I'm doing. Okay, so so the environment right now is the Windows driver kit. Okay. Um, we didn't want to. Part of, I mean, there's a lot of. If you think about doing user mode drivers, there's a lot of room to say, well, we'll throw away everything that was there. Like, we want to do it with Visual Studio. We don't want to do INFs. These aren't kernel mode drivers, so we can make a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. um, but then you don't focus on the hard parts about doing the, the framework. Um, so we, we rely on, on the existing patterns for as much as we can. We use INFs for installation, we use the DMI system to do all of our installation, and we do all of our building in the kit. We just didn't, we didn't have time to really sure. take on, like, how do you change the development process. Uh -huh. um, that said, we've been talking to the WDK guys, because obviously Visual Studio is a really good match for UMDF. Mm -hmm. um, for a number of reasons, we could use their debugger. Right? A lot of people aren't familiar with WinDBG. They're familiar with the MS Dev debugger, um, which can't do kernel stuff, but can easily attach to a user mode process. Sure. Um, and then the other thing is, and this is, I think, really, I would love to see this happen. Um, deploying a kernel mode driver on your development machine is a little bit scary. Deploying a user mode driver is really is not that frightening, right? We can't crash the system, so as long as you can clean it off. You could say, write your driver, hit F5, have it build, have it install and deploy on your dev machine, mm -hmm. and then have MS Dev hook up and break in at driver entry, basically. Excellent. Um, so we're, the WDK guys are sort of looking in their free time at, at you know, what could we do with MS Dev? Um, and we just had a meeting with them and talked about some of these ideas, too. Fantastic. Um, and I keep, tell, I keep saying that UMDF, I think, is if they want to play with that, UMDF is the space to start because we have the customer base mm -hmm. right, and the tools will work really well for us. And one of the fears using MS Dev or Visual Studio for the kernel mode stuff is that we're, we try to make sure you use the compilers that we've qualified. Right? There's, every once in a while we find that the compiler emits some byte stream that you know, doesn't do something, you know, doesn't deal well with Merkle changes or something else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and some of it's probably urban legend. But, um, so we try to make sure that you stick with the, the compiler that we use for the kernel and for everything else. For user mode drivers, again, it's probably not such a big worry, right? If you have some sort of compiler bug like that in there, you're only going to affect your driver and not the whole system. So, Absolutely. you know, if, if some tool were to sneak into the tool path, it's not the end of the world. So. Now, so how come there are any drivers still in the kernel? Why do they still need to be there? I mean, purely based on performance, or is that just mythology? So, a user mode driver framework, a kernel, a driver running in the user in user context is going to have extra processing has to be done, obviously, yeah. right? And so, you wouldn't have a video driver in user mode. Well, you? you're starting to see display, like if you look at the new display architectures, mm -hmm. my understanding of them, and I'm not a display expert, is that a lot of the rendering work is actually being done in the app now. Right? They're rendering streams of graphic processor commands, and then they have a small kernel mode component mm -hmm. who can take care of then shuffling those commands over to the processor on the card. So I think we'll start to see, I think, you know, even without UMDF, we would still start to see some of that divorce um, in the bigger stacks. It gives audio, I think, is doing something similar where auto, audio rendering can happen in process, mm -hmm. and then the kernel driver is just responsible for taking those rendered streams, merging them together into a single audio stream, and handing it out to the card. Absolutely. Um, performance is one of them, mm -hmm. right? Uh, core storage, which I used to work on, is, you know, being a storage guy, the backbone of the operating system. If you've used a laptop with a slow drive, you know how important disk speed is, even for client scenarios. Um, and so adding a lot of overhead in there could be dangerous, um, networking, similar. Um, so that's part of it. But there's also issues around accessing hardware. Right? Um, you don't want to necessarily let any app touch device registers. And you currently, it's very hard to have an application handle interrupts and interrupt level code. Mm -hmm. 
So for for right now, at least definitely for, for Vista, if you need hardware access, the only way you can do that safely is to be in the kernel. But you know, most of the I, I think a lot of the growth in the device space is going to be on USB, Bluetooth, 1390, maybe not 1394, uh, wide band or ultra wide band USB and stuff like that, where those devices, where those run over protocol buses. So we can have a user mode driver who then talks to the lower protocol bus and lets that stack do the actual hardware access. So storage has some particular challenges because of the way file systems mesh into the storage stack. And then there's also the issue that a lot of these stacks have kernel mode components that talk to them. Mm. And so that breaks our layer, our, that sort of leads into this layering problem we, we just decided to avoid. So, But going forward, UMDF is a really a big part of our isolation story. We want to be able to get, ideally we'd be able to get everything but you know, high performance display, high performance networking, high performance storage, and you know, probably file system drivers would be like the four that we can't approach just yet. Mm -hmm. But all of the other stuff is peripheral stuff. Um, it's not core to system operation. I suppose if you're doing audio stuff, you might see it as core, but, but if we can hit the performance requirements for that, mm -hmm. there's no reason we shouldn't be able to move all of that out of the kernel given time. That would be great. I love that. I think they're a much more stable system. Yeah. Not that it's not stable already, but it would be more stable. The point is that software developers would be less capable of bringing down the system. Exactly. Yeah. Now, that said, it actually introduces a new problem, right? Right now, if one of your device drivers crashes, you don't have to worry what the user experience should be past the crash because it's a blue screen. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're doing is we're actually creating a whole new user experience problem where we need to be able to tell the home user, hey, you can't keep running Photoshop. You're going to have to probably stop and restart Photoshop because the drivers for your scanner crashed right? or the drivers for your this external storage thing you had crashed, so you probably want to run a check disk later mm -hmm. and trying to... You know, the challenge, and then the other part of the challenge is going to be leading them to calling the company who provided the driver as opposed to calling Microsoft support or Dell support to find out why they got this pop-up. Mm -hmm. um, so, But, I mean, that brings up a great point uh, in that unlike writing a driver in kernel mode, as a developer, I'm actually going to be able to intelligently handle my exceptions in the sense that... Uh, or I should say it better, the framework, your framework will be able to surface the exceptions with more meaning yeah. to the enclosing application as opposed to the kernel which just says, out of here. Yeah. We've, got, we've actually, I did some work early on um, and you know, with sort of, we need some time to see how effective it's gonna be, but I did some work early on to integrate with the new Windows error reporting. So when a driver crashes or hangs, or just like terminates for no good reason, mm -hmm. we actually log a Windows error report and we get get a message sent back through the error reporting system to Microsoft mm -hmm. with the stack trace and everything else and then we can stick those into buckets and then ideally we'll be able to track them down to vendors and get vendors to look at their buckets so that vendors can see you know, a very contained up view of their crash mm -hmm. as opposed to OCA where what they see is the entire kernel you know, and they're this, this much of it <laughs> now they're, they're this much, right? It's this much yeah. data and they're this much of the problem. That's fantastic. And so it should really help with that. Um, you know, we generate, we can generate contained memory dumps for every crash. And we in fact do, they, they sit with the error log so developers can go get that. Mm -hmm. um, so That's fantastic. Yeah. So the user mode driver framework um, is making drivers that much easier to write, but it's still somewhat of a black art. Mm -hmm still need to know what you're doing um, and I guess that's good to some degree yeah I mean, I, mean, I mean it isn't it's not good from a democratic point of view of like let's let you know people who write bb.net so Mort's which I don't know why they use that term it's unfortunate but Mort's and who could also be physicists I interviewed a physicist uh, a couple days ago Brian Beckman who works in um, the uh, data processing or you know, ADO.net type okay. of people. And um, he considers himself a mort, even though he's written operating systems that were like had t processes that run f 
forward in time and backward in time. Wow. So processes and anti-processes. So he's, but so he, you know, I think he was being a little facetious, but he just wants to get his job done, yeah. which is why he loves VB.net uh, and C Sharp, etc. Yeah. So it will be nice to see it. I don't know where I was going. I, I think I had was making a point, but uh, anyway, it, you know. Yeah. The, the I, I would like to be able. I I would like someday. It would be cool if we could get driver development to the point where it looked sort of like doing forms applications now, right? Where it's, you know, you, you might have a couple of flow control pieces, you might have a description of some common piece of hardware, and you can sort of plug these things all together, mm -hmm. and then you just end up writing a little bit of policy code that says, oh, I got this command, I need to make this light blink, right? Or, or make the device, you know, make the device do this or that or the other. Um, I guess the question is, if you look at the the app space, there's you know infinite number of applications that can be written, and they're they're easy to write, they're cheap, mm -hmm. right? Hardware is a little bit different. If you want to build hardware, you actually have to go construct something and put it together, and you probably have to deal with with a lot more with margins and construction costs and everything. So, you know, do we actually need that level of flexibility to really address what's in the device space? I'm not sure. Hmm. You know, it, it may be that 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 even with more junior developers taking this sort of stuff on, particularly if we can like talk more about drivers and OS classes and college, mm -hmm. um, that you know having this be brain dead simple to write a driver isn't isn't actually that useful of a goal. It'd be neat, but it may not really do what we need it to do. Sure. Now, how much of writing a driver is writing UI? I mean, audio, right? The audio. Um, so let, let's talk about that for a moment. Okay. So if I write a user mode driver for like an audio driver, I'm writing it for my mixing application. Mm -hmm. um, am I going to be spending less time? So I'm not, I'm not a driver developer, so I'm not sure how okay. this classification works. That's I mean, fine. you have the you'd have somebody who writes the driver and then someone who writes the application that communicates with the driver. Is that how it typically works, or does the driver developer pretty much own it, 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 like any project I think it depends on the scale okay. um, right I could you could see a one-person shop where they're doing the hardware the application and the drivers all together mm -hmm. um, usually here at Microsoft we sort of we often separate the UI work from the driver work just because the people in the driver mindset or the kernel mindset don't think so much about how to do button, how to make GUIs that look nice and are usable and everything else. Mm -hmm. And the, the UI guys don't necessarily know how to do all of the in-depth kernel stuff that needs to be done. So there's usually a separation between sure. the two. Sure. Um, my feeling is that, that in a lot of companies, there's probably app people and hardware people, and it's the hardware people who would end up doing the driver work. Because the driver really is just an interface between the application and the hardware. So it sort of be part of the whole hardware package would be a software interface. For it. Understood. So now, but I guess what I was driving at was the UDM, UDM with the user mode driver framework. <laughs> you're pretty much enabling me as an application developer, who perhaps I have to write a driver mm -hmm. for some simple device. I'm actually gonna be able to get my head around it. Hopefully, yeah. Um, I mean, that is that, that's going to be a metric of success, right? I mean, how big is your user base right now? What's your feedback like? Um, right now, our user base is actually pretty small okay. um, for a number of reasons. We started late in the Vista cycle. Mm -hmm. um, there was a previous version of UMDF that I think that I wasn't involved with that I think was called Crescent, was the code name internally. Mm -hmm. It was entirely for Windows Media Player 10. They never saw it. And it none of the APIs were ever published outside of Microsoft. It was for them to do their MTP driver in user mode. Um, and so that was happening during the beginning of Vista. And that went out with Windows Media Player 10. And then we decided to sort of productize this into a device platform. Um, but we started late. We were a small team. Um, we had a setback or two along the way. And so we really did, we, we picked up one internal partner, which was the portable device guys. Mm -hmm. And they have, I mean, everybody there, they're mostly focusing on class drivers. So they have an MTP class driver, they have this file system class driver, but there aren't like dozens and dozens of drivers out there. Mm -hmm. um, the Sideshow guys, I think, are probably going to bring in more drivers for us, um, you know, just in terms of customization of the, the lower end um, auxiliary display hardware. Mm -hmm. um, 
So going forward, we're, we're still trying to pick other teams to partner with. Um, we get a lot of we get we get some good we get quite a bit of good feedback. Um, we got good reception at WinHack. Cool. Um, people seem to like the lab we did. All the stuff's online. I don't know what the download counts are for it. I should probably check that someday. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, we're it's it's still sort of slow going at this point. Sure. Um, and I would imagine you have the um, uh, sort of the culture of driver developers that you have to deal with. We have a lot of that. Um, right, because I mean they're used to, it's a, it's hard to write a driver. Yep. So they're experts, they've figured it out, and they like having the power. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, I might blue screen, but I can write very powerful code. Yep. That's really fast. You know, I made a joke at one point early on, because we work with a lot of the consultants. Um, mm-hmm. We work with OS, we're, we know the OSR guys, um, we work with Don Byrne, we know Don Byrne. We argue with them a lot, at least. Um, and so, you know, we talked at WinHack with a bunch of people, and there were a lot of, of you know, driver consultants and, and industry driver writers there. And I sort of made the joke afterwards that maybe these guys aren't the people we should be talking about how to make the model simpler, mm-hmm. because they make a lot of their money off the fact that the model is quite complicated, <laughs> and they're good at it, right? I mean, I don't begrudge them that, but, you know, do you necessarily ask them how to get themselves out of that business? <laughs> Now that said, it's fun. The funny thing is, you know, I've talked to, I've seen mail from Don about this. I talked to him a little bit about it, and he actually seems excited about UMDF because he, I think he gets a lot. Of, I think what he's saying is he gets a lot of projects that are, you know, this would this would not be worth his time for the amount of money. You know, he'd have to ask for way too much money in order to be able to do it, um, and it's not that hard. It's just that they don't know how to get started. So part of his thinking is if he can sort of get some money out of it by pushing them towards UMDF and getting them started, that, that the company can take over their own driver project after that point. Um, but he can still get something out of it himself. So, so, so that could be really exciting. I mean, the way we're going to be, the way we're, we're looking at adoption is really by going out to the device teams. So we're working with the smart card folks. Um, we're working with some of the new storage development around um, memory cards and stuff. Um, we're working with the ultra wideband guys. We're talking to the networking guys. We're talking to a bunch of groups about, you know, getting them excited about UMDF um, and thinking about what it can bring for their their development partners. Excellent. And then we think it'll be easier to get. It's going to be easier for us to get adoption when there's a broad class of device classes that, that support this. So. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it seems it seems pretty excellent. Um, and we'll see how it evolves in terms of uh, how many people actually write, take advantage of writing these remote drivers. Yep. You know, we, we need to definitely push people in that direction. Yeah. By making it a policy someday in a, in a future version of Windows where you can't write anything in the kernel. Yeah, you know, would at, be nice. at WinHack this year, uh, Daryl Havens kept sort of saying, Daryl, we he haven't doesn't, seen him. He doesn't yeah. want kernel, he doesn't want any third party code in the kernel. Understood. And I don't know if that's, that, that's a great goal. I don't know if we're ever gonna completely get there. But for a lot of this this device extension stuff, UMDF is a good way to move it out. So you've been working with Daryl and team, uh, um, figuring out how to make it performant. Daryl's been badgering us about how to make it performant. Um, <laughs> a little different. Uh, no, Dar- I mean Daryl's a great guy to have on our side, obviously, yeah. um, and he's very he is very excited about UMDF. Mm-hmm. Um, and I seem to remember at his at his ask the expert session at WinHack that he was making a lot of crazy promises about UMDF. Okay. So be interesting to see what we have to deliver on there. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, thank you for your time. It's great to learn about this stuff. Thanks for the I mean, opportunity. No this problem. Is, this is yeah. new and fun. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, there, there's definitely some driver writers out there that will watch this. Um, the KMDF video got good viewership. Good. And uh, let's see... Uh, so let me ask you this: How do people contact? Like, what's the community like for this stuff? Um, okay, so we have a we have a beta program up on connectmicrosoft.com. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the the uh, we're actually sort of bundled in with the WDK beta. Um, I have a blog on MSDN. Um, okay. Blogs.msdn.com/slash/peterwee. Okay. And I haven't written it in a while. I've been swamped with work, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But my last couple articles involve finding the beta and getting the WDK installed. Okay, um, great. So hopefully that'll be useful. Excellent. Um, we have a UMDF FDBK alias at Microsoft.com, mm-hmm. um, which is where we're asking people to send send mail. 
with any suggestions or questions that they have that they don't want to ask in the news groups. Um, but there's also a news group on the beta program. Cool. So and we'll get these links up on Channel okay. 9 with the cool. post. But uh, perfect. Great. Thank you. Great to meet you. Yeah, it's good to meet you too. Thanks.